1949 until 1959. Uh, in 49, I was a scriptwriter. I see. Uh, and uh, on contract. And uh, the State Department, which was then the, uh, uh, the, the chief body. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Are we rolling or shall we start from the yes, beginning? We are rolling. Yes. We are rolling? Okay, wonderful. We can, we can start. Wonderful. Let's start again. Um, I don't know if we're rolling when uh, Mr. Alexander was saying his full name. <coughs> okay. Let's start again. With the name? For your full name and your title, please. And we can get started with... Well, my, I'm retired, of course, as you know. But That's what okay. My... That's okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my first question after that will be, um, how did you get the job with Voice of America in 1949? Okay. So what is your full name and your job title, please? Uh, Edward Alexander and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer from USIA. Uh, I began working at The Voice in 1949. At that time, The Voice uh, was under the aegis of the State Department, and we were situated in New York, on 57th Street and Broadway, in two buildings, actually, uh, the language services uh, and, uh, and the studios were in the Fisk Building, and the uh, news and commentary and features were across the street in the General Motors building. Uh, and uh, we reached each other by teletype or by telephone or sometimes visits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, in 1949, the State Department decided that it would initiate broadcasts in some of the other, the smaller republics of the Soviet Union. Russian and Ukrainian and Georgian had already been broadcasting, but they wanted to expand. State Department wanted to expand to the other, some of the other republics. Foremost, Armenian, and then Azerbaijan, uh, Uzbek, and Tatar languages. And they asked me to recruit people for the Armenian service, and if I found anyone from the Azeri uh, uh, camps, uh, to uh, uh, bring them in also, and also Uzbeks and Tatars. So uh, I did that in 1949, and it took me the better part of a year. And then when it was over, uh, I, uh, I had recruited uh, five Armenians who had been in the Red Army, captured by the Nazis, and had refused to be repatriated back to Armenia, to the Soviet Union, and came to New York. Uh, now, you may ask uh, why these Armenians. Well, uh, and you might have said, well, certainly recruiting Armenians in the United States would have been easy. But it wasn't at all because uh, there were close to a, a million Armenians at the time uh, in the United States. And they spoke, we spoke, I spoke, Western Armenian. And Western Armenian is different from Eastern Armenian in, uh, in uh, words, language, uh, uh, the meaning of words, uh, and uh, also uh, a lot of the political expressions, et cetera, et cetera, and inflections of the voice. We can understand each other, but not completely. And the important thing is that what they speak in Eastern Armenian is the only way we could really reach them. If we spoke in Western Armenian, they would have to be saying, wondering, what, what did he say, <laughs> what did she say, and so forth, so on. So at any rate, that's why I focused on these uh, displaced persons as they were known. Well, for the first year, that was in 1950 when I got them, uh, for the first year we did uh, dry runs in studios, not broadcasting, just recording everything on a large platter and then analyzing it after. You should have done this, you should have done that, you raise your voice here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we were finally ready. Uh, and uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, little glitches were worked out. One, one may not seem very <laughs> amusing, <coughs> but uh, uh, one day, the first day we went into the studio, uh, one of the, the, the editor had a script he was going to read. It was the political commentary. So the producer gave him a signal to start, and the first thing he does is push the microphone away and start reading. So I stopped the whole thing. I walked in. I said, why did you do that? And he said, well, the microphone was in my way. I couldn't read the script. Uh, that, that's a, a silly sort of thing, but, but it did happen. Um, 
Mr. But Alexander, those people did not have journalism training. You had none to of train them. None them. Of them. I, I didn't find anyone with radio experience. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, their command of English was not what we would want. How could it be, you know? I mean, the, the language they stressed in Armenia at the time and through all the republics was Russian. Uh, so I had, to, I had to train them not only in radio techniques, of which I had had some experience in college, but also in, in the language and uh, being a, a, a formerly a journalist, I mean, I, I knew the nuances and so forth and so on. But then there were political nuances, which were very difficult uh, for them to understand. I'll give you an example. Uh, the news, of course, was primarily political and from Congress. And uh, the editor one day said to me, I don't understand this sentence. It says, they're tabling something. I said, yes, they're tabling a motion. He said, well, all right, motion I can understand. But he said, tabling? What is tabling? He said, you know, in, in Armenian, table is, is a word. It's a, it's a noun. And he said, and this is a verb. So I had to explain what tabling meant, postponing, and so forth, so on. Because he had said, if you table something, do you put whatever it is on top of the table or under the table? So it's silly things like that. Uh, there was another thing, too. It was 1950, and the elections were, were beginning, the campaigns were beginning as they are now. And, uh, and one of the commentators came in to me and he said, uh, he said, do you have to be an athlete uh, to be a candidate for Congress or the White House? I said, an athlete? What are you talking about? Why an athlete? He said, because the script says they're running all the time. He said, they're running for this or running for that. So at any rate, I, <laughs> I had to explain that to him also. Then there was the hill. What's the hill? Nobody understood. We were in New York. So I had to explain. I said, you know, maybe some, someday you'll be down in Washington. We'll go to Washington on a trip, something like that, over a hot, long weekend. And uh, you, can, you can find out what the hill is. Uh, none of us realized, I certainly didn't, that three years after that, we would all be going to Washington permanently here. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, everything went along very smoothly. It was very, very good. How many hours of programming did the Armenian service have at the very beginning of your service? Fifteen your minutes. Service? Fifteen minutes if, daily. Fifteen minutes a day, right, right, to be, to be uh, heard uh, in Armenia at seven o'clock in the evening. Where we find out, found out through smuggle letters and visitors who would, although they were pro-Soviet, they would say something about your seven o'clock broadcast and how, how they, that's how we, we knew exactly what they were talking about. Uh, at any rate, uh, Everything was running along very well uh, until uh, we were really hit by something very, very hard, the investigation of Senator McCarthy. Now, at the time, VOA, or as it was known in the State Department, the International Broadcasting Division, um, was, was under the aegis, as I said earlier, of the State Department. And McCarthy, uh, who was looking for communists all over the place, especially the State Department, suddenly realized one day that, oh, the Voice of America is part of the State Department, so let's go there. So they came to New York, he and his crew. That's something none of us will ever forget who were there at the time. Did you meet him? Was he there personally with he his came, team? He came a couple of times. I didn't talk to him. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, but Roy Cohen, who was his first, first, first right, his right hand, actually, and his, his agent, really, uh, Roy Cohen would come into my office because th where they were working was down the hall from us in New York and my, my office was nearest. He used to come into my office, not greet me, not say hello, nothing, not ask could I use the telephone. He would come in and pick up the phone and say, get me the senator at the Waldorf Towers, which is where McCarthy was staying. Then he would give him a report on what they did that day. At any rate, but I must say, the focus of their investigation was on the East European language services uh, because uh, East Europe uh, had, from East Europe we had in all of these services former uh, diplomats, former statesmen who had all been, which were widely, widely accepted in, in Eastern Europe, they were all former socialists uh, of various colors and so forth who had fought communism and now they were under investigation for being maybe pro-communist and so forth. And of course, McCarthy saw in this uh, the intrigue, you know, of taking over the voice of America. Well, 
it was devastating. It lasted a few months, and uh, morale shot down, all the way down. People were scared and nervous and anxious. Anybody could have been identified. We, right? none of us had anything to fear, but we were filled with fear because of it. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, they gave up and left. And in their wake were shattered reputations, destroyed careers, and even one suicide. Is that right? Of Absolutely. a broadcaster from what service? I'd rather not say. But somebody. But East Europe. Eastern European, and you knew that person. Oh, yes, very well. Very well. Devastating. Just like everywhere he was, it looked like people's reputations and careers That's were right. destroyed. How did Fioe recover after that, morally, you know, spiritually? Well, it, it, was, very, it was very difficult, uh, but uh, and, and the East European services had to recover. They knew they loved their jobs, those who were not under any investigation. And we, of course, and the Soviet, and the whole Soviet division had been pretty much spared uh, because of the nature of the, of the personnel that we had. But uh, not everyone was spared. But in any case, once McCarthy left town, uh, we felt somewhat uh, alleviated and, and a, a huge sense of relief. But it did take, it did take a while for morale to, to go up again. Uh, and uh, when it did, uh, Everybody was very happy. We were all living in New York. Uh, I certainly, and a number like myself, born and raised in New York. And, uh, and all of these people who had been living in East Europe uprooted and came to the United States. Uh, and all of some knew English. They had to improve their English. They had to find housing, this and that, kids, school, so forth. And then in 1953, uh, the Eisenhower administration decided to make VOA take it out of the State Department and put it into a new organization called the United States Information Agency. And at the time, a lot of people were wondering, well, what does this mean? The, the headquarters now of USIA said, Washington, what's going to happen to us? And what's going to happen to us is VOA had to move to Washington. And how that was going to be done, none of us could figure out. Well, it wasn't for us to figure out. We were told, continue to what you're doing, everything you're doing. The only thing we might ask you to do is do a few programs ahead of time and make, we'll see if we can give you sort of neutral news. How was the, what was the reaction of the broadcasters and management to well, the move they, to Washington? They were upset, not as upset as they were with the McCarthy mm -hmm. investigation, but, uh, but the fact that having been uprooted, as I said before, from East Europe, from Europe, you know, to New York, to, to the United States, now they had to get uprooted again and, and move from New York to Washington. Uh, and uh, again, finding housing, schools for their kids, making their wives comfortable in homes, you know, that were near the school for the children, near shopping areas, et cetera, et cetera. And what this meant was you just, you just don't pick up lock, stock, and barrel and move from a city like New York to Washington just like that. You have to go to Washington first to find out about housing, about schools and this and that, which meant you have to go back and forth, back and forth several times. Did you do that? Did I, you had to do, I had to do yeah. it myself. I For had to do family. it myself, yeah. And I often wondered how these poor people could possibly do it. And I was giving advice to as many as I could, you know, and so forth. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, we all now who live in Washington, we're accustomed to the roads, you know, and everything, the Beltway, et cetera, et cetera. So everything was, was beautiful now. In 1953, when this, this came up, it wasn't like that at all. And uh, uh, the roads were crowded. They were not new roads by any means. Uh, the roads we know now were, uh, hadn't been built yet. The Delaware Memorial Bridge was only one span, you know, and the traffic was, was huge on that. So when you got there, there were long lines and so forth. But there was another way to cross the river. That was by ferry. And the ferry was a single ferry which would go <laughs> one side and unload and load and come back and take time. So going from New York to Washington and coming back was a real journey a tiresome journey uh, and, and uh, a travail, really, and exhausting, really exhausting. At any rate, that was just another problem. But we survived. We survived because uh, there, there is one element which has existed for a long time at The Voice, 
that's a sense of humor. Lots of people have a wonderful sense of humor, and Europeans, especially East Europeans, <laughs> they have a devilish sense of humor and so forth. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you an example. For instance, uh, every morning uh, in New York, there was at, I think it was at 10 o'clock, there was a policy meeting. This was the policy which was given by the State Department to VOA in New York. And it was headed by uh, our chief at the time, whose name was Foy Kohler, uh, a seasoned diplomat, served at that time, had already served twice in Moscow, and Ed Kretzman, who was the policy officer, very sensible guy. And uh, he would give us the thing, he would give us with a very straight face sometimes, and you could tell from the look in his eyes and so forth that this is not the way I would do it, but so forth. It's not, I'm not criticizing the State Department, but it's the difference, you know, from New York to Washington, I mean, you can't do these things like that. At any rate, uh, one day, he had a policy director from Washington, and we all sat and looked at each other in astonishment. What is that supposed to mean? The policy was it had to do something with, as I recall, a disarmament problem between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And the policy directive was stress, but do not emphasize. And he stopped and looked at us, and we all looked at each other. <laughs> stress, but do not emphasize? Don't they both mean the same thing? You know, and so forth. To this day, when I meet colleagues of mine from that day, we greet each other, hello, Ed, hello, George, and so forth, and then we both say almost simultaneously, stress but do not emphasize. We've, they've never forgotten that, you know, and so forth. That, that is, was only one of many examples. That yeah. is interesting, very nice. Let's, uh, let's touch a little bit the Let's talk about the move to Washington, D.C. of the Armenian service in 1954, I understand. What was that like, moving to the new studios, getting used to um, a new setup here? And how did the Armenian service grow? I'm sure you added more programming? It did, yes, we did. It went from, uh, from 15 minutes to a half an hour and then an hour, uh, which gave us the opportunity. Originally, originally the program was news and commentary. But expanding it gave us the opportunity to do features, feature stories. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse my coffee. That's okay. <coughs> I'll start again. That's okay. Okay. You can pick up. You finished your sentence, so you can you can pick uh, oh, up. Oh, all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the feature stories were primarily about Armenian life in the United States, and how not only how they were adapting but the things that they were doing, and how Armenians had become prominent uh, in political life, in uh, films, uh, in radio, in the arts, the sciences, and uh, in other words, the opportunities that, that they, they could grasp uh, in the United States and had done so successfully and made a name for themselves. Uh, and uh, this was true of the other language services also. You know, if you watch television today, you look at the credits, it's amazing. Uh, you don't see Smith or Jones and so forth. You see all kinds of gobbledygook names, you know, and so forth. Uh, and, and it's absolutely astonishing how all, all, all these immigrants or, or, or people who had come over at that time, uh, leaving, leaving uh, Europe uh, and seeking a better life in the United States, uh, how they had made a name for themselves. Uh, so this gave us a great many opportunities and all the services to, uh, uh, to feature stories about the success of minorities in the United States. And these played a big role in, in, uh, in, in conveying to our audiences uh, the advantage of coming here and, and, uh, and uh, the difference between uh, this was still Soviet, Soviet time, the difference between American life and Soviet life. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, we were sorry that they were there, but we wanted them to know what it was like. And, of course, Radio Moscow didn't like that one tiny bit. Were you jammed? Were the Armenian broadcast jammed? The jamming. I'm glad you raised the jamming. Uh, I asked one day if I could hear some jamming, because we couldn't hear it in New York. When I heard it, I just almost passed out. I couldn't believe that human beings could do this to other people, honestly. It was unbelievable. The jamming was barbaric, 
barbaric. What would it sound like? A, a jumped it broadcast? Sounds, if you can imagine a thousand bears and a thousand lions growling, you know, and so forth, and completely blotting out. Well, it turns out that uh, we didn't have to be that discouraged by it. It was more a reflection on, uh, on, on Soviet attitudes towards free speech uh, uh, than, uh, than what they were doing to, to us in blotting, blotting us out. Because uh, uh, the, the, the jamming, uh, although an obstacle, uh, was not that much of, of, of an obstacle to the people in the Soviet Union, not just Armenians, but Russians, Ukrainians, all the others too. They found ways of, of going around the jamming because at that time it was all short wave and it was a short wave, it was on many, many, many stations, it's short wave. And they found a way to do that and that's how it got through. The jamming never stopped. It never, in other words, it never abated, you know, so that it was finally down to nothing. It was never down to nothing. It was always there. How many years were you the chief of the Armenian service? From sir? the beginning, yeah. From, the, from 1950? Yeah. From 50 to 1959? Uh, 59, yes. As chief of the service, what was your vision? What were you hoping the service, the Armenian service, brings to the population of Armenia during those hard well, what, times? What we wanted to do very much, uh, uh, was to convey American life, American society, uh, and, uh, and the institutions that existed in the United States, which did not exist over there. Uh, over there, life was very primitive. Uh, it was barely, people were barely able to make a living. Uh, whereas in the United States, there was always the, the chance for of rising and uh, opportunities galore. What we call now the American dream. And the American dream was, was the primary purpose of conveying this. Uh, so, uh, What was the reactions you were getting from that side? Where I know it was probably hard for your audience to reach you by phone or letters. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was the feedback? And how did you find out about what people thought of your broadcasts? Well, we had, we had from time to time, we had an inkling of how it was getting through. There would be a, a, a smuggled letter, let's say, or a visitor. Uh, now, a visitor, you may say, well, how could he be a visitor, he or she? Well, uh, they were pro-Soviet, uh, no question about it. Uh, they could not have been, I mean, in, in vocally, anyway, they were. Maybe in their hearts they weren't, because they would come, they would visit us at The Voice. We would have visitors from the Soviet, Soviet Armenia in our, in our office, and, uh, and, and they would tell us how wonderful it was to hear The Voice of America. In, in the Soviet Union, uh, and uh, uh, when when to to come to the end of what you're ultimately probably referring to, when the voice was finally it was finally decided that a number of languages would be cut from the voice because of what happened in the Middle East and so forth and the rising uh, tide of that. Uh, then, when the voice finally ended its broadcast. Uh, and Armenia was already a free, the Soviet Union had collapsed, we began getting letters. When I say we, I was no longer there, but, but uh, the, voice, the voice and the Armenian service began getting letters. Uh, and one letter is one that I will never forget. Uh, the letter said, how could you possibly not be broadcasting anymore? We depended on you to learn about democracy. How could we have democracy here without you? You are the, 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 the big hope of humanity, uh, and, and uh, we no longer hear your voice. This letter was signed by 257 people. Now, that may not seem like a lot of people, but Armenia is a small country, and you can't have people running around saying, hey, sign this letter, sign this letter, and so forth. That was an immense, an, an immense, what should I say, ray of hope. For us, that it was so. The Armenian service, uh, while it did not broadcast anymore in radio, uh, it switched to television, uh, and uh, it has now a huge audience. Armenian TV from from the United States, from The Voice, is on every Saturday with a huge audience. We we've, we've been told. So it has caught up. We lost radio audience. We did indeed, yeah. But we did win a lot of TV audiences that's right. in Armenia. That, that's right. Yeah. You know, one day, as a matter of fact. Uh, I got a call from a man who said, uh, this was just a few months ago, 
he said, uh, I work for Armenian TV. They had a man over here too. And he said, I've heard a lot about you. Uh, could I come and do an interview with you? And so I said, fine, why don't you come? So he came and he did a long interview. He liked the house. I had Armenian paintings. I had a lot of mementos from Armenia that I collected. Uh, and uh, and he, uh, uh, he did, a, he did a, a program. I've never seen it. People have come from Armenia and said, we saw you on TV, <laughs> which was very nice, but I've, ne I've never seen it. Uh, but, uh, well. I wanted to go back to the 1950s. You, you moved here in 1954 with your, with your crew. How large was the Armenian service at the time? How many people were there in the service? Yes, it, it grew to uh, nine people, as I recall. From four to nine. From, f from four to nine, that's right, yeah. What was the and, atmosphere? Go ahead. Well, the atmosphere was very, very in, good. It was very good. Of as you the, moved here the, to D.C., close to the hill, a larger building. That's right. You know, everyone, everyone felt eventually, you know, and initially everyone was upset, you know, that we had to move and this and that and so forth. But, of course, a lot of things improved, and, and this is the voice of America speaking to you from Washington. You know, Washington is the capital of the United States, and in some respects people think it's the capital of the world. And it had a big impact, just that alone. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we felt there was an authority in what we said, and the people felt that also. When we reported on the president said this, or the, the speaker of the house said that, and so forth, so on, it had much more of an impact on us and infused into the way we presented this uh, than it had in New York. So it was good that that happened. Right. You were not here for a long time. Five years after the move to Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., yes. you left the Voice of America uh, for the USIA. Yes. Tell me about that. Why, why did you decide to move? Oh, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a voluntary move. I, I didn't decide. I loved what I was doing. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I really uh, I wanted to stay. But... Uh, one of the officials at The Voice uh, had, had uh, transferred from The Voice to, into the Foreign Service and was in Berlin. Uh, and he was director of RIAS, RIAS being the radio in the American sector. This is when Berlin was still a four-power thing. Uh, and, uh, and he requested me. Uh, my German is very good. Uh, and so he requested me uh, to join his staff at Rios. And so uh, I, I did, but I had to find, I was told I would go, but because, and forgive me, uh, this, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't speak in this way about it, but I was told that the, the Armenian service had grown to such stature that I had to find someone who would replace me and succeed me. Uh, so. Uh, it took me a while to find someone, but I finally did. He at first said no, but <laughs> I wheedled him into it. I wanted to go to Berlin, and Berlin was very exciting. So you worked for the USIA in Germany, in, in West Berlin? I, I certainly did. How amazing is that? <coughs> How long were you with the USIA, and when did you retire? I retired in 1980. I had to because retirement was mandatory at the time uh, for 60-year-olds. For 60 year olds. Uh, and. Uh, so uh, I did, and then after that, uh, I still had a year to go. Uh, so uh, I went to the Board for International Broadcasting, where, where I worked for a year until my complete retirement. I see. But Berlin was, I, I couldn't get Berlin off my mind. How many it, years were you there, and what I, did you do? I was there in, for five years in Berlin, five very exciting years. I mean, the war had only been over a few years. Uh, and. Uh, and the city was still in shambles, buildings ruined, and so forth, so on. Uh, and uh, I got there in 59. Two years later, the wall went up. And I was in East Berlin at the time because we used to go, we were broadcasting to East Berlin. And I was always there for attitudes and opinions and so forth. And uh, boy, the shock, the shock of, of seeing these people, the women crying babies in their arms, the men wandering around aimlessly with trying to get on the U-Bahn to go from East Berlin to West Berlin, which they still could at the time, waiting for the train, uh, suitcases half open, luggage all over the ground. 
it was terrible. And then in 1963, something happened, which I'm sure you know of, when John F. Kennedy came to Berlin and made his famous speech, and I was standing right in front of him. Ich that bin ein Berliner, he said. You saw that speech. You heard it live. I was you right in front of him. Oh, boy. That, and the thrill, the thrill, the crowd just blew up. Just, they adored him, didn't oh, they? absolutely. And, uh, How? What a historical yeah. moment. It's a great moment. I'll never forget it, yeah. I, got, I have eight millimeter movies of it, which I'm going to donate to the Kennedy Library. How amazing is that? Mr. Alexander, you came back to the uh, Armenian service actually not long ago, recently, and you've seen how VOA has changed uh, over the last few decades. What is your impression of the way uh, the Armenian service is broadcasting news and information to that part of the world? Well, I didn't actually. I did not hear. I did not hear any of the any uh, any of the broadcasts uh, uh, that that they did here. Uh, I know that they were continuing the news and the commentary and so forth, but without the sort of a tone of belligerent, you know, in, 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 the, in, uh, in the presentation, uh, we were talking now to another free country, uh, and uh, and it was uh, it was it was it was wonderful to hear. And I was going to use the word exciting. I'll save that for this next thing, which is in 1967. Uh, I was uh, in the embassy in Budapest, Hungary, and uh, Washington asked me to go to Leningrad, as it was known at the time, to look at an exhibit. Remember, we had big exhibits at the time, USIA, to see if I thought it was appropriate for Hungary. So I said, okay, I would go on one condition. And this was on the telephone, and he's, one condition? as though, what right do you have to ask a condition of us, you know? And I said, I would like you to authorize me to go to Armenia. And for the following reason, explain, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, he said, I see. All right, he said, that might be good. You'll do a report on that. I said, of course I'll do a report. So went to, I went to, we went to Moscow and to Leningrad, uh, and um, I liked the exhibit and I approved it. And then my wife and I flew to Armenia, where we spent a week, an extremely, exciting week. And why? Well, outside of the people that we met and so forth and so on, we actually sat down in homes to listen to the Voice of America in Armenian. How amazing is that? That must have been very touching I for can't you. tell you. I can't tell you That's what it was like. Chief. The voices were people that I had hired, I had worked with for years, and so forth. And uh, When was that, sir? What year were you 1967. there? 1967. 67. So. 67. And uh, it was the year, <laughs> it was the year of the of the Six Day War in Israel. And when I heard that, I to go back for a moment to the McCarthy investigation. I say, how is that connected with that? Uh, it reminded me of something that that the McCarthy people had a question that I had raised about Voice of America. You know, they were looking for communists for insidious intrigue and so forth. And one of them said uh, had, had apparently said to the head of the Israeli service. That's where I bring it up. He said, what language are you broadcasting in? The man said, we're broadcasting in Hebrew, obviously. He said, why are you broadcasting in Hebrew? He said, in, in Israel they speak only Yiddish. Wow. Everybody was astonished at that. But it gives you an idea of how superficial these people were and how ignorant. VOA had an Israeli service at the oh, time? Oh, yes, absolutely. We did. It's oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. We'll have to probably wrap up because uh, the studio will, has another reservation. But really quick, um, Mr. Alexander, what are your thoughts on the future of Voice of America? What do you hope VOA will accomplish in you know, bringing news information in America to the world, including Armenia? Well, I'll tell you, uh, it has been, uh, it, it, it has been a, uh, much of a blow to, to us and if I may refer to us as the old timers who grew up with the voice really, uh, to, under, to, to hear, to know, to realize that we no longer broadcast in Russian or Ukrainian or some of these other languages or East Europe wiped out. Now the Middle East is the big thing, of course, and so forth, so on. And it's, it's sort of pushing all of that aside. Now, we, we, can't, we can't have uh, exhibits and we can't, uh, 
Well, we do have a public affairs officer. We always did have a public affairs officer in, in some of these countries, but not all of them. And, uh, and, and these were, the, these were the, the officers, the USI officers, who arranged not only exhibits, but libraries and, and had contact with people. And uh, the Voice of America was for me and for them great training, great training in, in addressing issues relevant to both both major powers, all, all powers, but these two major powers, uh, and, uh, and elaborating on them, explaining them, and so forth, so on. But talking into a microphone, into thin air, so to speak, you know, not knowing, is it reached or is it not reached? We, we just didn't know. When we were there as officers, we were talking with people. And uh, now, we, we don't, we, we, we haven't done this in some of the Central European uh, former Soviet republics, but throughout all of East Europe, throughout all of East Europe, I mean, I served in two countries of East Europe, in East Berlin uh, and in Budapest, and uh, still under communist control, and was able to talk with editors who some of them had never listened to the Voice of America. Uh, so uh, there was an approach there. There were artists, intellectuals, so forth. It's one of the great things about a PAO. I have to tell you, in most of the embassies I worked with, the PAO was always a source of envy, you know, because we were the ones who were out doing things, talking to people, and so forth. And some of the what other officers. What does that mean? Public affairs officer? Public affairs officer. I You've see. heard the phrase public diplomacy, I'm sure, haven't you? Of course. This is the successor you now to, to USIA, the Public Diplomacy Council. Uh, we were doing public diplomacy all the time. Uh, it hasn't changed, it's just, it's just the name that's changed. USIA is no longer in the news, it's, it's non-existent. It was shut down, yeah. It's shut down, it's non-existent. Uh, and <clears throat> absorbed into the State Department. Uh, and those people who are trained or assigned, they're not trained really, they're assigned to embassies as public affairs officers uh, are not doing the job that we were doing. And I, uh, I, I regret having to say that, but it's, it's true. It's true. One last question, and I'll ask you to, to um, have a short answer, please, so we can wrap up. Uh, we're celebrating next month the 70th anniversary of Voice of America. Why is VOA still relevant after 70 years on the air? The Voice of America was the only means of reaching, the only means of reaching all these troubled people all over the world, especially after World War II. Uh, and it was the only co connection, the only connection. Uh, I would, uh, uh, well, you want a brief answer? I'll try to do very this. Brief, very, please, very brief, Very brief, yeah. To, when I was leave. still chief of the voice, I was approached by Armenian political parties, say, so you have to do this, 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 and I would say the same thing to all of them. This is not the voice of Armenia. This is the voice of America. And that's, that this was true not only of us, but of the Hungarians, the Greeks, the Turks, everybody. Do you think VOA is still relevant after 70 absolutely, years on Absolutely, absolutely. I hope it goes on forever. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time, Mr. Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'm sorry we didn't have more time.